Hello, it's Ruby. Today I'm going to be sharing 15 autumn book recommendations with you. These are books that just made me feel so cosy when I read them and which hopefully will help you get into the autumn spirit. These are all perfect books to cosy up with on a rainy Sunday afternoon when the night is coming in, you've got candles burning and you've got a plate of chocolate biscuits and a large strong mug of tea. So um, get yourself a cup of tea and um, I am going to talk through these books with you. The first one is the Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children series which I am sure you've probably heard of, I hope that you've heard of it at least um, and if it's one that you've been meaning to read but haven't yet then this is your sign to do it. First of all I mean the books themselves are stunning. The author Ransom Riggs used actual photographs which he found in um, like antique shops, the kind that you can find in places like Snoop's Paradise, and then he used these to tell the story. So he'll be talking about something and then he'll say, oh, you can see it in the photograph. And these aren't doctored, they're actual pictures. So you've got this wonderful blurring of history, like actual truth, and then the fiction. And um, it just fits so perfectly with the fictional world which um, Ransom Riggs is building because it's situated within the real human world. And he kind of uses the world of the peculiars to explain strange things that happen and why strange things might happen, uh, which kind of leaves everything up to mystery as to whether this stuff is true. So um, the general premise is a boy called Jacob happens across this home for peculiar children. All of these children have peculiarities. They have strange gifts, uh, things like levitating, and uh, there's a who can control bees, like he holds bees in, in, his, in his mouth, and there's a boy who's invisible, can predict the future through dreams, control the dead, all of these incredible gifts, um, and Jacob happens across them and finds out that he has somehow involved within this world. Um, so you've got real life and then you've got the peculiars who live separate, and um, but they kind of like overlap and uh, Jacob finds out that the children are in danger and so he endeavours to help them and I just really love the overall feel of the book. It's very fast paced especially because of the world building which makes it really interesting to read. It kind of reminds me a bit of Stranger Things but like a very old fashioned version because all of these children were born in more like the Victorian period but they've been trapped in a time loop which means that it's the present day if that makes sense just read this book it's really great and i think there are six books in the series like and as soon as you read one you'll want to keep on reading because all of them end with cliffhangers which is wonderful for storytelling but also quite frustrating because you can't resist reading the rest the second book is Coraline which is another spooky book uh, by Neil Gaiman I'm sure that you've seen the film of this but some people don't realize that it was based on the book by Neil Gaiman I know that the film wasn't directed by Tim Burton but the film definitely has that Tim Burton feel to it and I would say that Neil Gaiman is the literary equivalent to Tim Burton um, he has this wonderful like eeriness to his writing and everything is just a little bit uncanny a little bit not not what it should be. So uncanny as a word comes from uh, the German word unheimlich, meaning like unhomely, uh, and th there's something just unsettling about it, and that is definitely the case with Coraline. The general premise is a girl called Coraline moves into a new house, discovers a secret door, and through the door there is a parallel universe which is just like her own life but everything is just slightly better. Um, the food is slightly better, her parents are nicer, all of the things that she wants in her real life are um, are better in this in this separate world but the only catch is the very strange and unsettling thing is that everyone has buttons for eyes uh, it's a wonderful premise so so great and um if you like the film you will love the book it's also very very quick i used to read this every year the night before the first day of school which shows how quick it is because it probably took me like an hour and a half every time next of course i'm going to recommend the sherlock holmes books i love these editions i've got the um bbc editions uh you can obviously get beautiful hardbacks uh in charity shops quite affordably but these ones will have introductions by the characters and creators of the show so this one has an introduction by Mark Gattis. The one that I will recommend, I don't actually have a copy of it though because I borrowed it from the library when I read it. All of them are great for autumn, you know, classic mystery stories, I don't have to explain them to you. Uh, Sherlock Holmes is a fantastic character, just so unique. I love that he's so hyper-focused on his work, so involved in it, uh, and his mind is just incredible. Wonderful to behold, and especially because we see it through the eyes of uh, his associate Watson, uh, who is, he's intelligent still, but, but not quite so brilliant as Sherlock Holmes. And so um, it's cool seeing Sherlock Holmes through the eyes of Bolton. The one I will recommend is The Hound of the Baskervilles, which is where 
Watson is sent out to investigate Vicious Hound, which has been spotted. And I just love the setting of this book. Um, I love the Victorian London setting of a lot of uh, the Conan Doyle books, but The Hound of the Baskervilles is perfect for autumn because of the large uh, misty moors in which it takes place. Next, one of my favourite books of all time, which is the one and only The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Um, my edition is, I think it's 1915, you can see on the inscription, this was a 21st birthday present from some family friends and it's just gorgeous. I love having nice editions of my favourite books. Um, this is one that I do dip into quite a bit as well. In my opinion, Oscar Wilde is one of the best writers to ever have lived, if not the best English writer to have ever lived um, and written. He's so extraordinarily clever and witty and wise. Um, and I think that that comes a lot from his disdain towards convention. He's singular, he's uh, you know peculiar, he's, he's interesting as a person and he doesn't really care that much about what other people think, which I think is, is a really cool quality. General premise, Dorian Gray is a very handsome young man and he has his portrait taken and he kind of wistfully looks at this portrait afterwards of course it's a stunning portrait because he's very handsome and uh they look at the painting him and the artist and there's this wistful like how amazing would it be if if your face could stay like this forever in the same way that it does stay perfect in a painting and that's exactly what happens the portrait and the real Dorian Gray swap. The painting ages on behalf of Dorian Gray and Dorian Gray's face remains the same. So all of Dorian Gray's sins appear on the paper. Every time he commits a crime, every time he does something bad, it appears um, in the painting and he remains unblemished. It seems to be very much rooted in Victorian physiognomy, which is the idea that like, by looking at the body, we can understand the mind of somebody and we can understand their personality. The painting becomes more grotesque with all of the things that Dorian does. And the actions that we do, the things that we do will affect the way that we look and that people can tell if we've done evil just by looking at us, uh, which is the idea. I think the really cool thing is that we can't imagine what Dorian Gray's picture, painting, actually looks like. And so we're kept in the dark from it in the same way that everybody else who is encountering Dorian Gray, they're in the dark as to like what he's actually done and what he actually looks like. Um, and we're the same because we never see the painting. And I think that's so cool. And I think that's why this book should never be made into a film. I know it has been, um, and I kind of refuse to watch it just out of principle sake, because the whole point is that we don't see it. Maybe if you were to do it as a film, you'd have to not show the painting until the very last moment because that's kind of the whole point, like we don't we don't see it changing. Next is a book I actually read this year, and this is one of the best books I've read this year, um, definitely in the top three, The Binding by Bridget Collins. Uh, the premise of this is so clever, um, like honestly genius. Imagine you could erase your grief. Imagine you could forget your pain. Imagine you could hide a secret forever. It seems to be set maybe in the 1700s or 1600s very loosely, um, but, this is a world where books are highly controversial, um, very taboo because of how they are made. For a book to be bound, for a book to be written, for a book to exist, it must take somebody's memories. So um, in this world, a book binder is somebody who sits down with somebody and extracts their memories to put into a book. And it's meant to be a consensual thing. Um, Bridget Collins is kind of exploring whether that actually is the case and um, I guess like the ethics behind, behind this world. I love, love, love the setting of this book. It's very autumnal. I think it's set in autumn or winter. It's very cozy to read, especially the first half while he's working as an apprentice and um, in the flash Flashbacks. The characters are also very complex, and even if they don't initially make sense, every dis every decision, like even the tiniest, tiniest thing, ends up making sense. I just think Bridget Collins's ability to craft characters in this book is exquisite. It's some of the best character building that I've seen, um, especially since it jumps around with time. We actually see like differences, very marked differences in the characters depending on when we are looking at them. So yeah, this is brilliant and also the book itself is gorgeous. Next is The Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Kaboski. I read this twice. I read this once when I was maybe 12 and then again when I was 19 perhaps. I had very different thoughts about it both times. If you read this a long time ago, I would recommend rereading it. I read it once when I was younger than Charlie and then once when I was older than Charlie. This is about a uh, boy called Charlie told entirely through letters um, to somebody he doesn't know. So Charlie is starting high school, he's 14, starting high school for the first time, and he's documenting 
his first year of high school in letters to this person not expecting to receive a reply it's kind of like a diary but it's it's being lost um and i think that's that, that, that that's quite it's quite a nice image as well you know like sending off the letter it's gone and he can't reread it he can't revisit it Charlie has really struggled with his mental health, he has depression, and I think it's incredible that Stephen Kowalski was writing about that, I think this was in the 1980s, 1997, the kind of the conversation that he's having about depression here, it does seem slightly ahead of its time. I think it did a lot for destigmatizing, talking about mental health. Charlie as a character also has just so much wisdom. Uh, he, you know, he's a wallflower, Perks being a wallflower. He just sits there and he and he observes things, forms conclusions about them, and I think his reflections are just like, really, really wise. It's very relatable as a teenager reading it. This is another YA kind of book, coming of age book, uh, but one which I feel like not a lot of people have heard about. It's called The Distance Between Lost and Found by Catherine Holmes, and it's been a while since I read this one, so please forgive me if this review is a little bit rusty, but I loved it when I read it, um, like 2016-ish. So it's about a girl called, I can't even remember her name, Hallelujah. Hallelujah is on a school trip and they're hiking in this woodland area. Oh yeah, it's also kind of a bullying book. So Hallelujah, Hallie has been bullied um, and now she's on this youth retreat with some of her bullies and she ends up after a prank getting lost on the trail with somebody else. It's not cozy of sorts because being stranded in the woodland isn't exactly cozy, but I do like, I do remember having quite nice nature imagery. A very um, low level capital R romantic uh, description thing because it's you know, like the elements are harsh in this book. Also very fast paced, very quick read. And I really love in particular how it questions culpability and responsibility. What's the difference between luck and chance as well? I'm now going to recommend one of my very favourite books of all time, which is Cat's Eye by Margaret Atwood. I'm sure you've heard me rave about this book, but I don't think I've spoken about it online for a couple of years now. Maybe, maybe like two, three years. Just, I don't know why I haven't. It just hasn't come up, I suppose. This is filled with annotations as well. I just love this book. I think it's Atwood's best book or in my opinion. It's about a girl called, what is her name even? Elaine and it switches between her as an adult painter who's returned to her family like where she grew up in Toronto for an art show and it switches between this and her as a child and it's her as an adult remembering and growing to re-understand what happened to her as a child and kind of coming to terms with her trauma I suppose. So um, Elaine as a girl was best friends with a girl called Cordelia and um, the t friendship was very toxic and it's interesting how like her as a child didn't really understand that and even her as an adult isn't fully aware of that and we kind of see like her relationship with Cordelia how she looks at Cordelia changing and shifting so much, but also it all being through the lens of her remembrance. So it's very fragmented and it feels all over the place. I just love how um, time also almost becomes a character here. Time is time is overlapping. It's not like, it's not a linear straightforward thing. It's all over the place and a sense of self is all over the place as a result of what as well. This book really thinks about how childhood affects us, how much our childhood experiences shape us as people. Atwood is also very good at capturing the child voice in this. And I really like how it, focuses on the power of friendship as opposed to romantic relationships, which I think is what books tend to do. Like adult books mainly focus on romantic relationships, but actually female relationships, Atwood is showing in this book, are very, very significant for development. Another of my favourite books is Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close by Jonathan Safran Foer. This is set in the aftermath of 9-11, a year after the disaster. Um, it's narrated by nine-year-old Oscar Schell, whose father died in... 9-11 the year before and Oscar finds a key in his dad's wardrobe and he thinks that it's a kind of message from his dad and he wants to find out what this key opens so he sets off around New York looking for the lock which fits this key and over the course of a year it's him like searching and looking everywhere trying to find what this key fits and find this message which his dad has left him. Uh, the really great thing about this book is how it's narrated. The narrative voice is one of the strongest, most interesting ones I have ever come across. Um, Oscar is autistic and um, Saffron Fur is trying to capture the way that he sees the world. Um, so we've got so many just like, there's a page for example where it, he's, he's getting really anxious and he's overthinking and the words just get closer and closer together until the whole page is black. Oscar is one of my favourite characters in literature, probably in my top 10. I'm about to go on a walk with my mum and sister and so I'm just going to quickly go through these three next books and then I will go through the last like three I think or four when I get back but I will be quite quick with these ones. They're all in relation to Frankenstein by Mary Shelley which 
is I keep on saying these books are some of my favorites but that's why I'm recommending them Frankenstein is one of my favorite classics and if you're wanting to read a classic this is a really good one to get into classics with because it's fairly short I think the writing is quite accessible maybe not the very beginning like the first few chapters are quite slow but after that the pacing is so so quick and just the writing is so engaging published in 1818 by 17 year old mary shelley the actual story behind how she wrote it is also so interesting and i'd recommend you looking into that i've got dr frankenstein who decides he wants to make his own man and so he gets dead bodies and he sews them together and he tries to induce it with life and that is how the monster is formed but he gets scared when he sees the monster and all in it, when the monster actually does come to life and so he abandons it and it's uh, about the relationship between creator and creation uh, which parallels Paradise Lost by John Milton which is of course the creation story um, of like Adam and Eve and God and uh, it actually begins the book begins with a quote from Paradise Lost did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mould me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? Did I ask to be born? I also love the unreliable narration in this. Narration is one of my favourite aspects. Like, good, cool, interesting narration is one of the things that will really uh, get me hooked on a book. So, uh, if you're the same as that, then you'll like this. So then the two other books are kind of spin-off. One's a way book, one's an older middle grade book and they're both inspired by Frankenstein. The first is Mr. Creature, which is about a boy called Billy who lives in Victorian London and meets Mr. Creature, who is inspired by the monster. And he's this terrifying tall, large figure who shows up in Victorian London and Billy is a thief. He thinks, oh, I can enlist the help of this Mr. Creature. So they become friends and they start working together. It forces us to look past appearances and look at people as people. The second one is My Name is Monster. Of course, you can already see the importance of this that in this it is a girl called monster and it's told from her point of view she doesn't have a name and she is the only person left alive on earth i don't know what it was exactly that wiped out humanity i don't know if they even say i can't remember if so but she's like left alone on earth and she is um trying to find her way trying to survive not unlike the monster going through the plains of like the ice caps in this and it kind of picks up on the debates and questions that Mary Shelley is raising here about um, what it does mean to be human and whether we need relationships the importance of relationships um, what what isolation means what isolation is and I will say as well I didn't like the first chapter of this and read the first chapter put it down thought I'm not going to read this and then I went back to it and I really liked it so read past the first three chapters that's when it really starts to get good and when you really start to see monster like the girl monster as a character as a person so um recommendation for that anyway i'm gonna go on a walk now a nice september walk with my mum and sister so i'll get back in like 45 minutes and tell you the rest um of my recommendations i'm back from my walk now and it was so lovely the leaves are starting to fall um i just i love september so much um and we're actually leaving for scotland this evening and I think it's going to be even more autumnal there. I'm genuinely so excited. So, next book though, I've only got three left. So, Doppler by Erland Lowe. Sorry, that kind of scared me. That's like my laptop starting up. So this is a Norwegian book. It's been translated into English. And it's about a man called Doppler who decides that he's going to move out of his suburban middle-class home and go and live in a tent in the woods um and whilst there over the winter he meets a baby elk called bongo and they become friends and um the book is kind of about consumerism and it questions what things are really important what we really need as humans what actually not only we don't need but which is bad for us and which we should seek to avoid everyone makes fun of him for it but it's a very wise philosophical book and it stretches from autumn through the winter so i think it starts in what's it say it starts in november and then it goes right through to april next we've got the children act by ian McEwan. ian McEwan is possibly my favorite modern writer i think he is able to capture like present moment, like tiny, tiny moments so well. And just real experience. His stories are engaging even though they're not like high fluted. This is about a judge uh, in the film. She's played by Emma Thompson. The film is also very good. It's a book kind of about like religion and consent and the boundary between adult and child because it's about a 17 year old boy who is making a religiously informed decision and um, the judge is deciding whether 
he should be able to make that decision because he's underage. Like when he turns 18, it turns into a very different story. And it's just funny because obviously between 17 and 18 in the space of a few months, your responsibility for yourself changes so much and your rights change so much. Also really interesting how it falls on one individual, like with a judge, it is up to her as to what she does. I also like how it's about a case, but it's mainly set outside of the courtroom. So we're seeing how it affects her personally, how it affects her relationships. And then the final book is Lanny by Max Porter. And I don't own an, a copy of this, but I do intend to buy it at some point because it's one of the best books I read in 2021. It is so different to what it sounds like on the blurb, I will first of all say, because I, wanted to read it but I also thought oh no this isn't my kind of thing but when I read it I really liked it so it's about a gifted and very sensitive child called Lanny he kind of perfectly embodies the idea of the romantic child that we see from Baudelaire he is just at one with nature very attentive to the world around him has this incredible wisdom as well um and the other villagers kind of look on in awe uh, at the way that he sees the world because it's so distinct from anything else. And this is Lanny. And Lanny goes missing and it's how him going missing ripples and has its effect on the rest of the community. And so we hear from the villagers what is happening. And then we also hear from this mythical figure in uh, like the mythology of the village who is partially narrating it. And um, this side of the narrative is so fascinating um, and some of it is literally just made up of fragments of conversations what the spirit is hearing um, in the village so it will be things like oh how much is the bread tuppence da, da, da. like it's so cool it's just snapshots of life and it feels very real and I yeah Max Max Porter is someone that I'm really excited to see more from uh, I've read two of his books and I just love his writing so there we go, they are my autumn book recommendations. I hope you enjoyed watching it. I will film another one of these ready for winter and Christmas, so stay tuned for that because I have so many Christmas book recommendations. I love a good Christmas book. And I did film a summer one of these, so I plan on filming one every season this year. Thank you for watching and I hope that you have a productive week. Bye.